Uh, we're going to start. This is lecture eight on continuing on finite state machines. And in particular, today we're going to talk about finite state machine optimization. We, um, I told you last time we, we talk about, we study finite state machines in this class because it gives us a useful way for designing sequential logic circuits. Uh, in fact, if we can come up with a specification for the circuit, functional specification, we can follow the steps that I showed you and it gives us a way to design the circuit. Right. So we're going to continue talking about that and in particular, as I said, how do we make state machines more optimal? And uh, this is uh, some material that I used to, we used to present in this class, probably haven't for about 15 years. And, um, I was talking to a friend of mine from industry who works at AMD and uh, talking about topics from the class and uh, he mentioned state machines and he said, oh yeah, state machines are really important. You should cover more about state machines. So I decided to reintroduce this material which hasn't been in here for many years. Um, so I haven't actually taught it for a while but I think you know, we'll get through it. Uh, and so I recalled some old slides from Randy Katz, who is a professor in EECS. He's now the vice chancellor on campus for research. And uh, he wrote a book uh, that we used to use. And so thanks to him for, for these slides and these examples. So. Okay, so the first topic here is uh, state minimization. And I'll motivate that here. So what we'd like to do is for a given finite state machine, we'd like to implement it with as few states as possible, right? Because remember, the states are, in, the state is encoded in a register, right? The fewer states we have, the fewer register bits we need, right? And the number of register bits are on boundaries of two, right? So if we have eight states, we need three bits in the register, because two to the three is eight. If we have six states, we still need three bits. So we have five states, we need three bits. So we drop down to four states, all of a sudden now we're down to two bits, right? So we can save the number of flip-flops that we need and the complexity of the circuits by minimizing the number of states. Also, uh, if we have fewer states, it probably leads to more don't cares in the logic that implements the next state and the output, right? And as we know, when we use don't cares, that simplifies the circuit also. Generally, what we want to do is reduce the cost of the circuit, the size of the circuit for a given function, right? So fewer states leads to uh, simpler logic. So here's an example over here. Here's uh, two simple finite state machines. Both of them implement this odd parity checker. I did an even parity checker in class the other day. This is an odd parity checker. And uh, there's two alternative state diagrams here. And it turns out they have identical behavior on all input strings these two, right? But the, the implementation, the FSMs would be different. Uh, the, the finite state machines are the same, but the, the implementations, the circuits would be different for these two, right? And you can see this one is more complicated. In the simple example, there's an extra state and it'd be more logic for other, th these other transitions because the combinational logic implements the, the state transitions and the output, right? So obviously it'd be desirable to find a simpler solution it would be cheaper, smaller on the area of the die, cheaper, less power, and uh, possibly run even fa run faster. Okay, so um, so our goal in state reduction is we'll design a state machine and then we'll find a way to reduce the number of states. Or you're given a state machine somebody else designed, and you'd like to simplify it into as few states as possible. So what we want to do is identify and combine the states that have equivalent behavior, right? Uh, what equivalent behavior means is for all input combinations, these states transition to the same state or to equivalent states, right? If two states for all input combinations transition to the same next state or, the sa or to equivalent next states, then those two states themselves are equivalent. So we need to find those conditions, right? So here's one technique we can do by hand, um, is you start with the state transition table, identify states that have the same output behavior, right? 
if such states transition to the same next state, then they're equivalent, right? So we combine into a single new rename state for those two states, and then repeat this process until there's no more that can be combined, right? So this seems like a simple way that we could simplify um, or reduce the number of states in the state machine. So I'll show you an example of doing that. Um, and this is called a row, this, this particular algorithm is called a row matching method because we're matching rows in the uh, state transition table. So here's an example finite state machine. We have a single input x, a uh, single output z. So we're going to take the uh, inputs grouping grouped four at a time. We're going to look at four bits. The output will be a one if the last four inputs were the string. 1010 zero, zero, or 0110. Zero, zero. Okay. It's kind of a simple state machine, but you can see this might be useful for something. Here's a example input output behavior for this state machine. Here's x, the input. So here, these four bits, we get them in one at a time. The output is 0000, zero, 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 zero because the input doesn't match the, uh, the, the, the strings that we want to match. And then if we get this one in 0110, zero, zero, we get a one out here. Uh, we get a one out here for one zero one zero, right, and a zeros for the others. Okay, so everybody see how the state machine works? We're just matching particular input strings to these patterns, or matching these particular patterns to the input strings. So, uh, how would we design the state machine? Okay, so you could think hard about designing it in an optimal way, or you could do a simple design and then figure out how to reduce the number of states later. Right, so I'm going to show you how to do a simple design. I'll get back to this in a minute. So we could take this kind of structure. Right? It's kind of a tree trace. This is the state transition diagram, and it has this kind of tree uh, type structure, where here's the starting state. Re we reset to that state. And then this is a Mealy machine, by the way. If we get a 0, we can go down this branch. If we get a 1, we go down this branch. On each side, then, if we get a 0, we go this way. We get a 1, we go this way. We get a 0 this way, 1 this way, all the way down. So by the time we've gotten to the bottom of this state transition diagram, we've enumerated all possible input combinations. Right? But what we do then is we can annotate each link here with either a 0 or a 1 to indicate whether or not we've recognized the desired string. So you can see in these gray ones here, 0, 1, 1, 0, we output a 1 because that's one of the patterns we're looking for. The other pattern we're looking for is 1, 0, 1, 0. And we put out a 1 here because that's the other pattern. For all other arcs, we just put out zeros. So for this kind of string matching type finite state machine, it, in general, it takes this form here. The only thing that would change would be which, what the patterns are that you're recognizing. In other words, where you put the ones out on the output. So for this kind of problem, this is what was back here, there's an upper bound on the finite state machine complexity, which is um, 15 states, right? Because that's how many states there are here. This is, a, if you don't believe me, you can count them 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, plus 4, plus 2, plus 1, and that's 15. So it's never worse than this. Now, there's some redundancy in here. We should be able to simplify this thing. So that's why I use this. It's a good example to show how to do state reduction, because we can find equivalent states here. And so we'll do that trying using our row matching method. So here's the state transition diagram for that. Um, 15 state state transition diagram that I showed you. Uh, it's drawn a little differently than I showed you the other day. Here's the present states. Uh, and I didn't, fortunately, unfortunately, I didn't name, number the states here, but we're going to number them this way. This is S0, S1, S2, S3, S4, S5, X6, S7, S8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Okay, so they're just numbered like that. You can see it in the table here. So here's our 14 states. And then we write down what the next state is if the input is 0 versus a 1. So this is the split. We go from 0 to 1 or 2. 
and then one goes to three or four, and two goes to five or six, right? And then three goes to seven or eight, et cetera, et cetera. So this is just encodes that, that diagram. And then here's the outputs, and the output depends on the input in which state, right? So if we're in state S10 and the input is a one, right? Uh, then we output a one. Uh, I mean, the input's a zero, output a one. And then if, the, uh, if we're in state 12 and the input is a zero, we output a one. All these states, seven through 14, those are the states at the bottom of the diagram, they all go back to S0 regardless. Because the thing just resets itself after four bits. So it's just looking for four bit patterns. Okay, so that's nothing special here. This is just a tabulation of this, this diagram, right? Okay, now we can start applying the row matching method. So we look for states that have the same output characteristic, right? Meaning they put out the same output for a given set of inputs or given inputs, right? Uh, there's a lot of possibilities here, but <clears throat> then we see if they transition to the next, uh, same next state or not. Okay, so let's uh, start with these two down here. If you look at S10, uh, the next state, uh, they both put out a one and a zero here, and the next state is S0 in both cases. So these two states function equivalent to one another, so we can reduce that to a single state. So we're going to rename S10 and S12 to S10 prime, right? and that's here. And we got rid of 12. Okay, so we've reduced it by one, and we can keep going with this kind of procedure. Um, look at these blocks of states, seven through nine. They all have the same next state behavior. They have the, all have the same output behavior. Same thing with this block. Right, so um, those can all get reduced down. So reduce all of those to um, to S. These all all six of these reduce down to S seven prime, which is shown here. Right, um, we can keep going. Let's look for other opportunities. Uh, there's these, these two go together. Um, let's see, S3 and S6, they look the same. So those will get reduced. And the S4 and S5 have the same behavior. So those will get reduced. And then we end up with finally this table up here on the right. So we really have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven unique states instead of 15 unique states. And if we draw, then we can redraw the state transition diagram based on that table, reduce table, and it takes this form here. Right. Okay. So, um, looks like a useful thing to know how to do. This gives you the freedom to design a state machine or design the state transition diagram without worrying too much about uh, the, having the uh, least possible number of states because you can kind of reduce it after the fact. Now, this, that method I showed you, it's, it's a useful heuristic and it's easy to apply. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't always yield the most reduced state table. Um, Here's an, actually, this example from before is an example that won't be simplified using that technique, right? Because using this, there's no way to combine. So if you look at these two, what's the difference? This is correct, this is correct, this is more reduced. Uh, the difference between the two is that S0 in this diagram on the left plays the role of S0 and S2 on the, uh, the diagram on the right. So we should be able to combine S0 and S2, but we can't based on the rule that I showed you, the, the, the row matching criteria that I showed you, because although they have the same output, they have different next state. We'd have to, in order to do it, we'd have to assume 
that S0 and S2 are the same. Once we assume they're the same, then we could reduce them because we could replace this S2 by S0 and then they would be equivalent. But we have to make that assumption first. So just simple application of that rule won't do it. So there's a, there's a more powerful way to do the state reduction and it involves a, kind of a data structure called the implication chart. Okay. What an implication chart is is this uh, chart that shows across, uh, that shows, gives us a way to look at pairs of states in a very systematic way. Okay. So what we do is we make this big rectangular grid where along the x-axis we list all the states and then we relist all the states along the y-axis and then what we're going to do is fill in these squares uh, according to what we know about those two states. Okay. So um, of course, we really are just looking for the cross product of all the states. So we don't need the diagonal and we don't need the upper half of the table. So we're just going to use tables that look like this. Okay, and I'll show you what we put in each square and how we use this table. So here's the method. <clears throat> we construct this chart, one square for each combination of states taken two at a time. The square labeled SIXSJ, some particular square in that chart, okay, um, if the outputs differ for those two states, SI and SJ, then we put an X in, that, in, that, in the chart. Otherwise, we write down the implied state pairs for all input combinations, okay? So we're gonna write down the next state for those two states, right? And then we advance through the chart, top to bottom, left to right. If a square S sub I, S sub J contains the next state pair SM and SN, and that pair labels a square already labeled X, then that square gets labeled X too, okay? This is the implication part. We have in each square, you'll see this in a minute when I go through the example, each square we're going to write down what next states have to be equivalent for this particular, these two particular states to be equivalent. And if we already know those, the, the next states for these two states are not equivalent, then we know that these two states can't be equivalent. We just kind of follow that through. Okay, so you continue executing step three until new new squares are marked with an X. And then for each remaining unmarked square, SI, SJ, then SI and SJ are equivalent. Okay, so let's do an example so you can see how this works. Here's a new finite state machine. This is just a simpler version of what I had before. We're gonna have an input X, an output Y, single, uh, well, output a one whenever the serial sequence of zero, one, zero, or one, one, zero has been observed at the inputs. Okay, so this will, um, kind of take on the same form that we had before, where S0 is at the top, and we go down to S1, and then S2, and then these split into uh, S3, S4, like this, um, kind of like that, okay? So in this case, we're gonna have six states, <coughs> and uh, the state transition table would look like this, and here are our two places where we match correctly, the input. Okay, so we can fill in our table like this. Okay, so here's the table that shows six states here, zero through five, six states here, one through six. Right. And this gives us the opportunity to look at pairs, all combination of pairs. Right. So if you look at the combination of S0 and S1, I have to go back, S0 and S1, these two, uh, they have the same output behavior. They will be equivalent if S1 and S3 are equivalent and S2 and S4 are equivalent, right? Because that will mean they're transitioning to the same next state. Okay, so we're gonna write down this fact that S1 and S3 have to be equivalent and S2 and S4 have to be equivalent. And we put that in the table for that pair of states. That's what we put up here. S1 dash S3, S2 dash S4. We're saying that S1 has to be equivalent to S3 and S2 has to be equivalent to S4 for S0 to be equivalent to S1. 
So if we can prove that they're not, then we're, if we can prove that these pairs are not, or one of those is not equivalent, then we can prove that S0 and S1 are not equivalent. All right, so we do that everywhere, but we put these x's in when they have different output behavior. For instance, S0 and S4, going back here, S0 and S4, see, so have different output behavior. So they can never be equivalent. We can just, that kind of is the base case here. We can eliminate S0 and S4 as being equivalent right off the bat. And in fact, nothing's equivalent could be equivalent to S4 because it has different output behavior than everything except for uh, S6, where it has equivalent output behavior. But that also gives us all those Xs. Okay, so that's the initial pass. The next pass is, if you look at up here now, S1 and S3, S2 and S4. So S2 and S4 are here. That, we have an X there. Therefore, we can propagate that X up to here because that says that S2 and S4 can't be equivalent. So then we can, that proves that S0 and S1 can't be equivalent. So we'll put an X there. And we can just do that moving all the way down like this, putting more Xs in. We'll keep going until nothing changes, and then we can see what the net result is. Right. And it kind of ends up like this. <clears throat> in fact, you can get that in one pass. Initialize the table, make one pass through it, and you get this set of Xs. The second pass adds no new information. Therefore, we can conclude that S3 and S5 are equivalent because they both transition, because we know S0 is equivalent to S0, obviously. Um, we also know that S5 and X6 now are equivalent, likewise, because we couldn't put an X in there. And because of that, because S3 and S5 are equivalent, and S4 and X6 are equivalent, then S1 and X2 two are equivalent. So then we can invent these new states, which are the prime. They're not complements. They're just prime. S1 prime, S3 prime, S4 prime, et cetera, and redo the table in terms of those. Right. So then we could draw the state transition diagram. OK, so this will lead ultimately to a simpler, a simpler implementation, because now we have only four states instead of what we had before, which were, uh, was uh, seven states. OK. Looks pretty straightforward. Now, uh, this same technique could be used. Uh, is this is another example. I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one. It's a more complicated state machine. This is a, another. This one happens to be a more style state machine. and. Uh, this was, has multiple inputs, not just single input. Right? So you have possibility of four arcs leaving a node instead of just two. Uh, the transition table looks like, like this. And then the implication table is very similar to what we had before, except that in these squares, we put all four. Uh, possibilities here because, uh, see, the next state possibility for each state, there's four possible next states because we can four, have four arcs leaving a, a state because we have four input combinations into the, uh, into the machine. Okay. So that means what we put in the implication table is um, a little more complicated. We have four rows. Again, this says we're checking to see if S0 and S1 are the same, checking to see if S1 and S3 are the same, et cetera, for all four. Right. So this example here, if you fill in the implication table and then you pass through it, propagating these Xs, we end up with just two squares here, right, which gives us um, the information that um, allows us to eliminate um, all, all the states except for those four. Right? So we eliminate, in this case, two states. OK, so that was uh, kind of the 
systematic way to do state reduction, right? which is one part of finite state machine optimization. The, the question usually at this point is, do the tools do you, this for you? I don't know. Like they might. Maybe you can try it out and tell me. Okay, any questions on state reduction? Yeah. Are the outputs, uh, um, so the difference in these charts, so if this is a Moore machine. So here the, there's a unique output associated with each state independent of the input. For the Mealy machines, you see the output is uh, dependent on what the input is. That's, that's the, the only difference really, essential difference. But the same technique works for both. All right. Um, the next topic is uh, state assignment. And uh, again, I'll, I'll motivate this and then I'll have some things to say about how to optimize for this. So when a finite state machine is implemented with gate logic, the number of gates that it takes to do that will depend on the mapping between the symbolic state names and the binary encodings. Um, and I'll show you an example in, in a minute of where you, why you, how you can visualize that. But remember, we did this. This is the combinational lock example, and we have five states here. And at one point in the process, we, we, we do the state transition diagram as a symbolic state transition diagram, meaning we have state names here. And the other examples are S0, S1, S2, et cetera, et cetera. Here are these other names. When it comes to actually implement it in circuits, implement this state machine in circuits, we have to assign bit patterns to represent these other states. Right? And the bit pattern will be in the register when we're in a particular state. Right? That's the way the thing works. We have lots of choices. We know we need at least three bits here because there's more than uh, four states and less than eight states. So we have three bits in our state register. So we have three bits in the state encoding. How do we assign our uh, state names to state bit, to bit patterns? That's a big question, right? Uh, in this example, how many different possible state, and this is called state encoding. This is this, the way we represent the, the symbolic states as bit patterns. We encode those symbolic names. And there's lots of choices. In fact, we have five possibilities for this. And once we assign that, then we have four for this, and then three for this, and two for this, and one for this. So in this case, with five states, there's 125 different encodings. No, there's more. I'm wrong. There's actually more because there's, that would be, you know why there's more? Because we're not using all, there's three bits, but we're not using all three bits. So we actually have, the first one, we can use one of eight patterns, we get zero, 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 through two, one, one, one. And then the next one could be, once we choose one of these, one we're gonna have, so this is eight, and then we're gonna have seven, possibilities, then we're going to have six, then we're going to have four, oh, sorry, five, and four, one, two, three, four, five. So it's going to be, um, what's this number? This is n, n factorial minus, uh, I don't even know how to do this. What is that number? Eight times seven times six times four times five. Do you know? Is it, you with me? You know what I'm talking about here? I'm just counting. 6,720. All right, so there's 6,720 6, different ways we can encode the state. 
each one is going to lead to a different implementation. All right, think about the process we went through. Some of those are going to be better than others. Our job is to figure out a good one or the best one if we can. All right. So, um, and the reason, you, the kind of intuition why one might lead to another, you can see here in this example. Here's this uh, state machine we had before, this uh, first string matching one. And um, here's one assignment of states. Here's a different assignment of states. And you can see the result in the Carnot maps that are the functions for the next state logic. Right? And here's one, here's the other. You can see in this one on the top, first encoding has a much better clustering of ones. So it's going to lead to, and, and maybe a more advantageous use of, uh, of don't cares. So it's going to lead to much simpler circuits than this one, which will have more complicated circuit, more gates. Right? OK, so what could we do to find a state encoding that's efficient and good? Right. Anybody have an idea? You should talk some. I get tired of talking all the time. You could do it a, what would be the brute force way of doing it? When you're faced with a problem like this, your first thing you should think of is, well, I'm going to try all possibilities and see which one's best. That would be the brute force, right? So try every encoding. Here we, in this particular example, oops. In this uh, particular example, we have um, this set of states, and we can try every possible state assignment and see what it turns out in terms of Carnot maps and with circuits, see which one leads to a simpler circuit. Right? <clears throat> Not very practical in practice, unless it's a very small state machine. Like we said, for this uh, combination lock example, we have, was it 6,000? 6,000 different things to try. It might take a while. You could write a program to try it, maybe. And that might be OK if you're willing to wait a while. So what you would do then is go through logic synthesis for each state encoding and see which one, by some measure, leads to the, uh, and the measure might be the number of logic gates needed. It might you find the one that leads to the best solution. <clears throat> Well, there's other heuristics we can use, too, that will kind of help guide us if we don't want to go through a brute force technique. I don't know that there's any optimal algorithm for doing this. People have written papers on this. And they all come down to heuristics, because I'm pretty sure this is another one of those exponentially complex or NP-complete type problems. So I'm going to show you some heuristics that we have used and that people use. Uh, it's kind of paper and pencil heuristic methods. And these kind of, uh, they look, you'll see them, and you'll see they kind of look intuitive. Uh, and it's kind of similar to K-maps. So what we want to do, if, if some state x transitions to state y, then we should assign close assignments to x and y, which kind of makes sense. If x state, we move to y, we'd like to change as few bits in the register as possible when we transition. Changing a few bits means, fewer bits means the logic associated with changing the bits should be simpler. Right. Kind of makes sense. Right. So for instance, if you look at this state transition diagram here, <clears throat> S0 uh, transitions to S1, so we should have a state assignment for S0 and S1 that is similar to one another. Right. Likewise, we probably want S2 to be similar to S1. So. Um, Previously, when we were looking at K-maps, we used uh, Carnot maps, did this gray coding. And the reason it used gray coding is that in a gray code, you only change one bit at a time. So things that are close to one another in a Carnot map, or this type of map, mean they're close to one another in the number of bits that are changed from one to the other. Right? So we can use a K-map to help visualize closeness of state assignments. So that's, that's the idea here. So if you look at this assignment, here we have S0 
here, S2 is here, S1. They're not very close to one another, but here's a better state assignment where we can put S0 here, all right? And then we want S1 to be close to S0 because it falls from S0. So we can put it right next door in this square, so there's only a one bit change to get to that point when it needs to change. And then S2, well, we can go over here to this side, that's adjacent. And then they both go to S3, so we can put S3 right in between S2 and S1. That's kind of convenient. And then S4 can be down here. And it's not optimally close to S. Um, it goes back to S1. We can't get it both close to both S3 and S1, so you know, we have to make a compromise somewhere. But you could believe me if I tell you this is a better status frame, and it's going to lead to a more minimal circuit. Right. So that's the basic idea here. And in fact, we can kind of measure how close overall our assignments are by counting the uh, number of bit changes in every transition that's in the state transition diagram. On every arc, we'll have to change some bits in the state register to implement that arc. And here's that first assignment, and it has a cost of 13. And this one has a cost of 7. It's a much lower cost. That should be a better assignment. Now we can take this a little further. So that's one. That's a very powerful heuristic. There's other heuristics that we can use uh, based on input-output behavior as well as the transitions. So uh, the highest priority one is what I was just talking about. We're going to give we give adjacent assignments to states that share a common next state. Uh, actually, that's that's a different one. Uh, this is. Yeah, well, actually, the idea I was giving you a minute ago is kind of combined in these two, these top two. So we're going to give highest priority to uh, adjacent assignments to states that share a common next state, such as in this uh, example here, and then the medium priority to states that share a common ancestor state, as you see here, and then uh, some priority but lower priority to states that have common output behavior. For instance, here, alpha and beta both have this ij common output uh, so meaning they output a j if the input is an i. And then we can apply these heuristics to assign states to any state transition diagram. And um, Here's an example of that. Okay, so this is a uh, three-bit sequence detector. This is similar to the one we were looking at before. Um, so remember, we're going to give highest priority to states that lead to a common next state. Okay, so we want S. S3 and S4 both lead to S0. Therefore, we want these assignments to be close to one another. S3 and S4 both come from a common predecessor state. So we want those to, again, we want those to be close to one another. And then we can look at um, this. If an input is a 0 and the output is a 0, then these states should be close to one another, the ones that have that behavior. And for input of 1, and output is zero, these states all have that behavior, so they should be close to one another in their assignments. Right. Sometimes there's conflicting assignments, but in this case, we again, again, we can use kind of a Carnot map type structure to look at the four states. And so uh, there's two different kind of equivalent assignments in this case. We know we want S3 and S4 to be adjacent to one another, so we can get that this way or this way. Right? And there's not much difference in the two this time. These two, they're about the same. Let's try another uh, example. Here's this four-bit string recognizer that we designed earlier. So um, in this one, Again, we're looking for states that have a common uh, next state. So S4 and S3 
both have a common next state of S7. Right? S7 and S10 both have a common next state of S0. So that's highest priority for our state encoding adjacency. Uh, medium priority for S1 and S2 because they both come from a common state S0. Two times for S3 uh, and S4. S3 and S S3 and S4 both come from S1, and they both come from S2. And then S7 and S10 both come from S4. So that kind of gets medium priority. And then lowest priority are these states according to the input-output relationship. Right. And then, uh, again, we can use kind of a Carnot map type structure to kind of lay out our state assignments and um, there's different possibilities here. And uh, yeah, anyways, you can see uh, S7 and S10, S3 and S4. Um, so that's a nice assignment there. And there's just different possibilities here, and some are equivalent to one another. OK. So. That gives you some heuristic methods. Um, computer programs that do this will kind of do equivalent things. Again, I don't know if our tools, how aggressively our tools will do state assignment. I think the FPGA tools do, and I'm pretty sure the ASIC tools do it. But again, this is something you can kind of check out for yourself, and see how good of a job they do. Questions on this before I move on? Okay. We'll test you with some homework problems on this. So that was state assignment. So what, for all these, we're assuming we're using as few bits as possible to represent the state. So in this example here, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven states. So we can represent that with three bits. Right? But what happens if we have th three bits in our register, right? Our, our, our state bit patterns only have three bits. What if we wanted to have more bits there? Could that help? You think it might, right? So that makes it even more complicated. Um, so. In general, the number of possible FSM states is two to the number of flip-flops, as I said. However, often more than log base two, the number of states flip-flops are used to simplify logic at the cost of more flip-flops. There's one example I'm going to show you, uh, one type of encoding I'm going to show you because it's a popular one, and it's pretty easy to understand. And this is called one-hot state encoding. We call it one hat because there's, in the state word, there's only going to be one one, and the rest will be zeros. Right. So here's an example. Here's a, with one hat encoding representing three states. If state one, state two, and state three, we represent state one with a one in the least significant bit position, represent state two with zeros except for one in the second bit position, and state three with a, a one in the third bit position. So we just use these three patterns. Right. So this is kind of an interesting thing, um, as you'll see. It, it leads to very simple implementations uh, and a design uh, procedure that's very simple. Because the circuit will match the state, days, uh, state transition diagram. And I'll show you an example on the next page. And this can often lead to simpler and faster next state and output logic. Of course, the cost of doing this is that we have one flip-flop for every state instead of log base two number of flip-flops for all the states. Right? So if you have a state machine that had 1,000 states, you're going to have 1,000 flip-flops to implement it this way. But if you used a binary encoding, you could implement it with 10 flip-flops. Right? Now, if you don't care about the cost of flip-flops too much, then this might be a good, good technique. And in fact, on FPGAs, there's lots of flip-flops. There's a flip-flop. Almost for every LUT. For, on the Xilinx FPGAs, there's a flip-flop for every six LUT. There's a lot of them around. 
In fact, in most designs don't use them all. We say it's flip-flop rich. So this type of one-hot encoding is not a bad way because it might simplify the logic uh, and you have enough flip-flops around to do it. And in fact, the, the, I know the synthesis tools for FPGAs for small state machines, they'll use one hot, this kind of one-hot encoding. And for bigger state machines, they use this binary encoding. When you encode states this way, you can think of your circuit like that state transition diagram where there's a token that gets passed around from state to state. You think of each bubble as a flip-flop, and it, most of them are holding a zero, and there's a one in one of those, and that's the state that the state machine is currently in. And the process of moving from state to state is just moving that one, the token, or whatever you want to think of it as, from one state to another state, or from one flip-flop to another flip-flop, because there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between states and flip-flops. Right. Well, let me show you what I mean by that here. So here's a even parity checker circuit um, back from the example that I did yesterday, uh, last Tuesday. Okay. So we can implement this thing with, now in the design that I did on Tuesday, we had a single flip-flop. If the flip-flop holds a zero, we're in the even state. If it holds a one, we're in the odd state. We're gonna do something different here. It's one hot encoding. We're gonna encode the state in two flip-flops if we're in the even state, there'll be a one here and a zero here. And if we're in the odd state, there'll be a one here and a zero there. And as the state moves, as the state machine moves between these two states, we're effectively going to move the one from here over to here. So it's just like a token thing that passes around. It keeps track of which state we're in. Right. So if you think of the circuit that way, you can look at this diagram and figure out how to implement that circuit just directly from this diagram without going through the state transition table and the kernel maps and all that kind of stuff, right? Because what I have to do then at each point here, I say, when do I enter the even state? In other words, when do I want to generate a one in here? Well, I want to generate a one in there if there's a one in here already and the input is a zero. Okay, if there's one in here already, so we take the output, we end it, with in inverted input, because I said when the input's a zero, that's this arc. If there's a one in there, this, there's a zero in, that will be a one there. We'll get a one here, and that'll allow it to load into the, on the rising edge of the clock, it'll load in. Or the other way to get into the even state is this branch here, and that's if the input is a one, and <laughs> there's a, we're in the odd state, meaning there's a one here. So that one will combine with that one to make a one to go in the even state. At the same time, we'll load a zero into here because you can check those conditions are all false. So really what we do then, at the input to each flip-flop, the D input to each flip-flop, we just have to enumerate all the ways that we can get into that state or all the ways that we want to generate a one in that flip-flop. So in general, the implementing state machines in this one-hot encoded method um, looks like this. There's a big OR of some ANDs, right? The OR is just the union of all the different possibilities, and each AND is usually there's input and then some state flip-flop here. Gets ANDed together. That represents the arc from that other state into this state here. State sub i. I think this is the coolest thing ever. When I learned how to do this, it got so simple to design state machines. And I've used it many, many times. I'll show you a bigger one next. Anybody have a question about this? So either you're confused or you get it. But if you're confused, ask. Ah, uh, yeah, very good. I, I meant to mention that. Okay, the important thing in this type of encoding, if you reset everything to zero, all the state registers, nothing will ever happen. You're just going to keep zeros forever. So you have to initialize these registers or these flip-flops so that the initial state gets a one and everything else gets a zero. 
if we want to initialize into the even state, then we have to reset this thing to a one and reset this thing to a zero when we reset the circuit. So usually we'll assume there's a reset signal that gets asserted when we turn the power on or at the beginning of your simulation if you're just simulating. Right? And we can arrange it in this class when we instantiate this flip-flop you can specify what the reset value should be for a flip-flop by, uh, that's a parameter. You can set it to have that thing re reset to a one and everything else just does a normal reset to zero. So yeah, good question. <clears throat> that's this. Flip-flops must be initialized for correct operation. Only one, one. Okay, here is the combination lock example in this one hot encoded uh, implementation. So again, we have five states, so we're going to have five flip-flops, one state per flip-flop, or one flip-flop per state. Uh, start state is over here. So you see, as I said, each there's this little sub-circuit for each uh, flip-flop here that tells us how do we put a one into that flip-flop. So for instance, the start state, we can get into that either by reset signal or by enter not being pressed and we're in this state. So that implements that loop right there. And then um, you know, for instance, bad one here, we stay in bad one. If not enter, that's this loop. Or we can get into there if we're in start and it's not reset, enter is pressed, and it's not combination one, meaning they had a bad combination. And we go and put a one in here. Everything else will get loaded as zero at that point in time. So I've made this one a little overly complicated uh, because I was not assuming that these registers have reset signals on them. Uh, so we've got this reset signal everywhere here. You could take that out and just have reset signals that go directly into the flip-flops. You don't really need the reset signal there if you have resets on the, on the flip-flops. Um, so this is nice. I mean, you draw. If you come up with this diagram, then you can come up with a circuit that has the proper behavior. So it's a powerful technique. Again, it um, probably is most useful for relatively small state machines because you don't want to have an explosion in the number of flip-flops. Right? But maybe you don't care that much about flip-flops, like an FPGAs. And so it could be a good technique for very large state machines as well. Oh, and the thing what I was saying is since this kind of lays out nicely on the surface of the chip because um, you don't have signals. If there's locally connected things in this diagram, you're going to end up with locally connected uh, connections in the, in the implementation of it. Right? So, um, and there's not a, there tends to not be a lot of logic between flip flops. So this can run, typically can run very fast at a high frequency. OK, questions on this? That's one hot encoding. So you know the, the generalization of this. So this is an extreme case where you have n states and n flip-flops. And we talked about the binary encoding state where you have, or, or the binary encoding where you have n states and log n flip flops. There's things in between, right? Not very well explored. And I don't really know how to find the optimal point there. It's very complex. But you know, maybe in some special cases, you can find some encoding that will lead to a, a simpler circuit. But you, these are the most popular. E either you, most often you'll see binary encoded state machines or you see one hot encoded state machines. All right, so moving on, I'm going to talk about Verilog. So I've showed you a lot of details of essentially designing state machines by hand all the way down to the gate level. 
in this class, once we get it to the gate level, we're pretty much just done because the tools for sure will take it from the gate level on. Um, in practice, though, usually we're going to be doing most of this in Verilog. But, and the tools will take care of the, uh, the lower level logic sy synthesis for you automatically. So this is the procedure. <clears throat> and for the lab, for sure, uh, for your project and everything else, if you have a state machine, you're going to implement it this way, just using Verilog. You probably won't use kernel maps and implement the uh, logic level circuits by hand. You'll let the tools do that. So this is the procedure for FSM design with Verilog. So it starts the same. We start with a circuit function specification, usually in English. We draw the state transition diagram. We write down the symbolic state transition table. Right? Uh, we'll assign encodings, bit patterns, to the symbolic states. Right? And you could employ the techniques we talked about here to find a good state encoding. Right, the heuristics. And then you can code this using Verilog behavioral description. And I'll show you those Verilog behavioral descriptions for some examples. Right. We use parameters to represent the encoded uh, states. Actually, we're going to use local parameters, which will be a new thing I'll introduce. We use register instances for the present state plus uh, for the present state to hold the state. We have a register. And we can instantiate a register for that. And then we'll have a combinational logic for the next state and for the outputs. Right. And then um, we use the case block for the combinational logic block. It's the simplest way to write a state machine. So within each case section, for each state, we'll assign all the outputs in the next state value based on the inputs. Right. Note, for the more style machine, We'll make the outputs dependent only on the state, not on dependent on the inputs. So let me show you an example of this. So here's a simple state transition diagram. It has three states, idle state, S1 and S2. It's, in hardware, it's going to look like this. There's a state register which keeps track of which state we're in. In this example, it's going to be two bits wide because we have to be able to represent those three unique states. Um, we have a single bit input here, and we have a single bit output. And we have a combinational logic block, which is um, used to implement the, um, uh, the next state logic and uh, generate the outputs. So this register uh, <coughs> holds a symbol to keep track of which bubble in the state machine we're in. Uh, and as I said, this uh, implements the output based on the input in the current state. If it's a more mach a Mealy machine, if it's a more machine, this generates the output just based on the current state. And then it also combinational logic block also implements the uh, next state based on the input in the current state. Okay, so here we go. Here's the specification of Verilog. Um, part of it, this is half of it. Right. So, um, must use reset to force to the initial state in a state machine. You have to have one, some way to force yourself to some known state here. It's dangerous not to, particularly in this kind of thing here because we have uh, two bits in the. We have two bits in the state register. We're going to use zero, 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 one, and one zero. If you were to build this, when you turn the power on, if you didn't reset it, it just goes into some random state. You don't know what's going to be in that register. It's not guaranteed to be zero, zero. We would like it if it were, but it's not necessarily the case. Uh, depends on the circuit technology and other things. If you were really unlucky and it reset to a 1-1, one, one, the state machine would get stuck. It would never do anything because it couldn't move because, well, it probably would because of the way we use the don't cares. But we really want to get it to, if you want it to start in zero, then you have to force it to zero. So we have a reset signal for that. And uh, Okay, so the 
FSM, this FSM is a module. It's got the clock input as reset input, has input and output. In this case, both input and output are uh, single bit. Right? Now, this is where we define the state encodings. This is local param. This is like the parameters that we had earlier when we were doing the generator blocks, except that the, uh, these cannot be overwritten. These are just local to the definition here. Okay. So we use these names, idle, S0, and S1. It corresponds to the state names that are in the state transition diagram, and I just made an assignment here. We use 0, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 0. Again, this is arbitrary. I can choose. I could choose uh, based on the heuristics that I showed you. And uh, in fact, this is not a very good encoding based on those heuristics. You might be better off with 0, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 1, although since S1 goes back to S, yeah, well, I don't know if we could do better than this, tell you the truth. I don't know. I think about it. OK. Uh, then here, I'm going to keep building this out. Uh, so those are constants local to this module. Uh, this is not a register, but assigns. It gets assigned out, is going to get assigned in an always block. So we have to give it this keyword reg in Verilog. This is uh, also going to get signed in the always block. And this is the next state. And then present state, that's going to be the value of the register. So here I instantiate the register, the state register. In this case, we want to have a reset signal, so I use the underscore R version. Uh, it's two bits wide. The initial state is idle. We can use this, the symbol here for the reset. So this says, uh, when you reset, reset to idle. Uh, give it the name state. That's the name of that register. And then here are the input and output connections. Q is the present state, D, input is the next state, and then reset gets the reset signal. Right. And then here's the fun part. Okay, so this is the, we use an always block for the combinal, combinational um, logic part of the circuitry. So it says always at present state or in. Okay, so this block is sensitive to present state or in. If present state changes, or if the input changes, then we're going to, this will do its thing. Uh, so case on present state. So, and what we do here, we have a, a section of the case statement for each state. So here's the idle state. We'll say begin. OK, so first of all, this is a more machine, so we can just set the output that corresponds to each state. So that's the first thing I do here in each section. So here we set the output to 0. We set it to 0 here. We set it to 1 here. OK, then I say if uh, n is equal to 1, <clears throat> then the next state is S0. Right? That's this arc. Right? Uh, else, next state is equal to idle. Then we just stay there. So for each state, we just kind of say how we transition based on inputs with ifs and if else's, right? And then um, I have a default state here to catch, because if you look at the combinations of present state, there's actually four combinations, or even though th only three of them are valid, I use this one so that the tool doesn't complain. In this case, if I were somehow to get a 1-1 one, one into the state register, then this would be the case that applies. And I'll just force it back to the idle state and set the output to 0. OK, so for each output then, we, for each state, we define the output value, the state transitions. Right? And then we use default to cover the unassigned state. Usually, it just unconditionally transition to the reset state. Right? So here's uh, this one is um, you can see from the state transition diagram. This is a more machine. Uh, 
it's very similar for Mealy machines. Here's a uh, Mealy machine on the left. Uh, the difference here, so you saw, um, here I unconditionally assign the outputs. Here in the Mealy machine, I assign the outputs based on what the input is. So if, for instance, if I'm in the zero state and the input is a one, then I sign the sorry, yeah, the input is a one, and I sign the output to be a one and transition into the one state. Right? Else the input is a zero. So we assign the output to zero, and we transition back to the zero state. Okay. So that's really just the difference in the implementation in the Verilog specification of a Moore versus Mealy, is that in the Mealy, the output assignments are conditioned with the uh, inputs, by the inputs. Looks pretty simple, right? So I'm going to show you one more thing, uh, which actually simplifies it even more. So the sequential semantics of the blocking assignment. So these kind of assignments that are inside of uh, always blocks, the kind we've been using for combinational logic, that has the equal sign here, is called a blocking assignment. For reasons I really don't want to go into, <laughs> but just so you know that name. And these blocking assignments allow variables to be multiply assigned within a single always block. You can assign something and then sign it again. And the latest one is the one that actually is the one that takes effect. It's just the way the language has be, been defined. So that allows us to really simplify things a lot. So here's this. So this was the specification I had before. This is a simplified version based on a few things. All right, and I take advantage of the semantics of the assignment. First thing is the sensitivity list. Um, I use a star. So this is recommended behavior, <laughs> recommended coding. So here, see, we say always at present state or in. Present state and in, there, that's the sensitivity list. If you don't want to bother with that, you can just put a star there, and the compiler will figure out which things your block should be sensitive to. In this case, since we're, we're using in in comparisons, right, and we're using present state in this case block, it can figure out that the always block should be sensitive to those inputs into the block. So it will do this for you automatically if you use always at star. So this is what we recommend you use that. Just avoid errors. The next thing is what we're going to do before the case statement is to make the default assignments and then we can override those default assignments later on in the case. Right. So what I do here, this is a begin end, part of the always. Next state, I'm going to set it to idle. So that's going to be the default next state. If I don't specify it anywhere else further down here, we'll just go into idle. Same thing, we'll make a default of uh, output of zero. This is kind of factoring out a lot of this common stuff that was down, a redundant stuff that was down here before. So now it simplifies the case block here. We have idle. We can say if uh, n is equal to 1, then next state is S0. Otherwise, we don't do anything here and we'll just retain those default values. Right? Um, and next time this block gets triggered, um, well, OK. And then uh, S0, uh, similarly, we can specify anything different than the default. So we say, uh, if n is equal to 1, the next state equals s1. Otherwise, you can see, we just go back to the idle and set the output to, um, and, and output is 0. Right? Um, s1 is, actually has a different output, so we have to re override the, if we're in the s1 state, we have to override the, um, the default for the output. But then here's the uh, next state going to S1. Um, otherwise, we go back to idle. Right. So uh, this is a better way, more compact way to write the same state machine. It has the same behavior. Right. 
So the use of the block with the blocking assignments allows signal values to be rewritten, simplifying the specification. So that's the point of this. Okay. So just a final couple final words about Verilog, and it kind of relates to state machines. Uh, you make sure all the signals assigned in a combinational always block are explicitly assigned values every time the always block executes. Otherwise, latches will be generated to hold the last value for the signals not assigned. Okay, this is, I talk about this here because we're talking about case statements and we could accidentally leave something out of a case statement. Right? So for instance, here we have select and select of 0, 1, and 3, and I left out 2. So what's going to happen in this case? Well, if you think about the semantics of this, out is not updated when the select line has the value of 2. So what the tool does is add state. It adds latches to hold the last value of out under this condition, because it doesn't know what to do to out in the case when select is equal to two. So the only logical thing for it to do is to put a latch there and retain what the previous value is. So this accidentally creates a state element and latches in this particular case. It's probably not what you want. And this will probably happen to you at some point. If you're taking the FVGA or uh, even the ASIC lab, you will, maybe the tools will report to you something about latches being generated. And it probably has to do with this a, and it can happen if then else too. So if there's ever a condition where not everything is fully specified, the tool will assume you don't want to change anything and just keep, in this case, the out signal at its previous value. Right, so the way you um, avoid this is to um, add the, <laughs> you could say, well, I know that select will never be two. That's why I didn't specify it. Right? So either you don't care about it. Even if you don't care about it, you can just assign it to something arbitrary. You know, if it's not going to come up, then it doesn't matter what you assign it. You can make it anything you want. Right? Um, or in general, you can use the default case as I did before. Right? Default catches everything that's not specified in a case statement. So you can set it to something, um, whatever you want, by default. Right? Um, if you really don't care about the assignment in a case, for instance, you know that it will never come up, then you can assign the value x in Verilog. And x is a little different than the x that comes up in simulation. When we use a simulator, simulators use the value x. Most of the simulators we use have four values for, possible values for a signal, 0, 1, x, or z. We'll talk about z later. x in simulators usually means unknown. It pops up if you have an initialized register and you propagate those values. You'll see x's move through your circuit. You've probably seen that already. It means unknown. x here, you're telling Verilog, I don't care. So this is treated like our dashes that we had in the, when we are doing the Carnot maps. So the synthesizer can use that don't care and simplify the circuit in a, w in a way similar to we said. Uh, so it will choose to make that x be a 0 or 1 to make your circuit simpler or faster or smaller, whatever it's trying to do at the time. Right. Right. So that's a nice thing about Verilog. Um, it's a little weird, though, because um, you have to be careful when assigning don't cares. If this case were to come up, even though you swear it'll never come up, it might come up. <laughs> later, and if it comes up, the synthesized circuit and simulation may differ because you have two different tools treating those don't cares and those two different tools might, if you, Verilog, if you simulate the Verilog with X's and then you take that same Verilog and you pass it to, through the synthesis tools, that synthesis tools may assign one value to that X, whereas your simulator of the Verilog may have assigned a different value to that X. So you may get different behavior if that case were to come up. So some mature designers I know say, don't do this, don't make Xs, just make an arbitrary mapping. Assign that unused case to zeros or whatever you want, but make it 
explicit, then both tools are going to have to treat it the same way, and you will not have discrepancies between simulation and uh, the, simula uh, the implementation, the real circuit, um, assuming if that case came up. And you never know. These cases that you think won't come up, they might come up because of a bug in your circuit. So then you just complicated things by having uncertainty or two different types of behavior. So for the little bit of savings that you get by giving a don't care to the synthesizer may not be worth the risk of having a discrepancy between your implemented circuit and the simulation. So, yeah. But so a latch is a state element, which means it needs to be connected to a clock, right? But like in the... In no, there's, there are latches that don't need clocks. Flip-flops have clocks, but latches can hold on to a value indefinitely without a clock. Remember I showed you a latch? Uh, Are they not overridden on like a clock edge? No. This, this is a way to build a latch. This is D and this is Q. So, and this is load. So just, this would be... Um, not necessarily a load signal. It could be just some other circuit that triggers the loading of the latch. And then it can just, as long as you don't load it again, it'll just hold its value. So it won't, ne won't necessarily be rewritten on the clock edge. Like, why is it so bad to have a latch? I feel like if you don't assign mm. something in the always block, then doesn't it make sense that you don't want it to change mm. and hold its value until you actually uh, Yeah, um, <laughs> there is, a piece, is something to be said for that. Um, why are latches bad? Yeah. Um, you got me. Uh, <laughs> we don't do it. <laughs> I'll think about it and tell you next time. They, um, well, it's, I mean, you want to have control over what you're doing. I mean, this is kind of an accidental latch. I guess if you know you're going to implement a lat, you're going to implement your circuit this way, maybe it's okay. But um, we don't recommend it. I'll have to get back to you. Which, there must be deeper reasons why we don't like it. Okay, uh, it's five o'clock. We're all, and that was the end. So perfect timing. Um, that's the end of State Machines. Uh, next week we'll start a new topic and look for new homework going out um, tomorrow.